Okay, so today we have uh, Tim Dockhorn from the University of Waterloo who's going to be telling us about uh, DP diffusion models. Yeah, thanks, Thomas. Um, thanks for the invitation. Yeah, so let's talk about differentially private diffusion models. Uh, this is joint work at NVIDIA with Tianchi, Arash, and Karsten. And before we talk about differentially private diffusion models, let's just uh, talk about diffusion models more in general. And I guess most people have heard of them um, by now. But I think I just want to get like everybody on the same level. Um, so they're best explained, I think, if we look at images. So for now, let's just take this image of this dog. And then we also look at noise of the same dimension. Now, we may just um, add some of this noise to the data. Um, so here, I have written like x0 plus um, some scaling um, parameter sigma 1 times epsilon. And now we may increase this uh, sigma parameter, so sigma 2 will be more noisy. And we can do this again. And eventually, if sigma is chosen large enough, in this case, um, almost all information of the data is destroyed. And so we now we may approximate x0 plus sigma for epsilon by just sigma for epsilon. And what this really means is that like the thing which we call now a diffusion process um, converges to a normal distribution. So here I have um, a normal distribution with variance sigma m squared. So I guess in this case, uh, m would be 4. And I indicate this um, that we are at the final step of the diffusion by this time parameter capital T. Now, I did this for like four um, discrete values, but we may also do this over continuous time. Um, so here I have like now sigma zero plus uh, x zero plus sigma t. You know, but uh, um, sigma might now be an increasing function um, that goes over the interval zero to capital T. And um, we can also describe this process equivalently through stochastic differential equation. Um, and some may of you have not heard of like stochastic differential equations before. But it's okay because um, at the end, this is just like a tool to explain and to understand diffusion models. But in practice, at the end, you can get away without them at all. Um, so the differential equation that describes this process is following. Um, so now we have here x plus um, the square root of 2, and then sigma dot is the time derivative of sigma, and then this w is what we call a Brownian motion. So you can think of the Brownian motion stuff. Um, as a process that continuously adds noise. And the main reason we do this is because there's uh, some work from the 70s that describes how we can reverse a diffusion. So now we, at the end, we want the diffusion model to be a general model, right? So we want to feed in noise and we want to get out new data. Um, so now we can reverse this diffusion process to go from noise to data. Um, and if you look at it, it looks very similar to the to the blue thing. So like the blue is what we call a forward process, and the green is what we call a reverse process. And except that we have this additional term, um, which is this minus two sigma dot sigma, and then with the scriptic gradient xt log pt. And what this thing is is uh, we call this the score function. And now what diffusion models really do is they learn a model for this score function. So I guess, um, yeah, we also call, it, call this model a score model. Um, and the objective function that we use to train the score model is the following. So let's go through it uh, one by one, what it is. Um, so we have here an expectation as usual in machine learning over the data, but then also we have a um, distribution over the time value t. So this is like this index on like how it tells us how much noise we add. And then we also have a distribution over epsilon, which is just a normal distribution. Um, and we can then, as before, calculate the, the noisy uh, data xt as x0 plus sigma t epsilon. And within this expectation, um, basically the score model is regressing um, towards a scale version of the clean data minus the noisy data. And to understand this even a little better, um, 
let's choose a particular oh yeah here i'm also linking to the derivation of this objective function which i don't want to go into detail right now but it's a great paper and uh, anybody yeah can check it out um yeah let's choose a particular parameterization of the score model um so this, we, we can choose whatever we want here and i am um, i chose basically this new neural net d minus xt over sigma squared and you may already see why i'm choosing this let's plug it in into um, the equation below so if we plug this in um we now basically this new net d now basically regresses towards clean data so d gets us an input noisy data plus the the, the time set or the noise level t and regresses towards clean data and this lambda t here you can just think of it as a um as a scaling factor so we may uh, want to emphasize the model to work well for large uh, t so like lambda t may be large for large t and yeah so we can basically choose this um yeah to decide where we want to emphasize on and let's say we have a big data set and we can train this model for a long time then after successful training we look back at our reverse um, stochastic differential equation and now we can plug in this model um, and i told you before in practice you may never need a stochastic differential equation well as it turns out this uh, SE here has an equivalent form or marginally equivalent um, ordinary differential equation which is the following so basically just get rid of the Brownian motion term and get rid of the, the two factor and then you can also equivalently assimilate ordinary differential equation so now that we have these differential equations how do we actually sample in practice um, we start basically from random noise so we just um, flip a coin and draw a new random vector and then we simulate the SDE or the ODE. And if we have a well-trained mo uh, well model and we simulate this adequately, so like using a numerical solver that has enough um, accuracy, we should get a, a new image. And then if it generalizes, we should be able to flip another uh, latent vector and we should get another image. So yeah, this is uh, diffusion models in a nutshell. Um, if there are no questions, I can just move on to what can diffusion models do. Um, so I guess I don't have to talk too much about this part yet. Like two years ago when I started working on diffusion models, um, you had to convince people quite a bit that this is something interesting and we shouldn't just use GANs. Uh, but I think by now most people know some of these applications. I think uh, what they're most popular for is um, text to image. Um, so yeah, there has been a lot of work on this and I think uh, yeah, it's really great progress within the last year. Um, besides text to image, we also have like seen at the end of last year, um, text to 3D. So where here 3D could be represented as these point clouds or as um, your radiance fields. And I think we'll see a lot more of this this year. And similarly, at the end of this uh, end of last year, and also I think we'll see a lot more this year, um, text to video. So um, this is maybe at an early stage, but yeah, I think the main problem right now with text to video is that we don't have as much data as we have with uh, text to image. But as as soon as we can find this data, I think we'll see um, as big a progress as we did in text to image. And then I guess a natural extension also from text to 3D would be to add a temporal dimension. So I've um, just recently seen this new work on text to 4D. Um, maybe a little bit more of a scientific application would be a protein generation. And in particular, this is large scale protein generation and this is really something that could not have been done before with other generative models, such as GANs or normalizing flows. Mm. 
And I think one really cool aspect about the fusion models um, is that they're also really easily fine tunable. Um, so imagine you have this big text to image or text to video model, and now you have some additional like images of your own dog or of your own cat. Now you, um, you can just fine tune these large models for a few hundred iterations. And what you get out of it is a personalized text to, in this case, either image or video model. This fine tuning ability has, for example, also then be used um, to fine tune stable diffusion, a popular text to image model uh, to this, this X-ray data set. Now, yeah, this is all great. And uh, I think we have seen a lot of progress, but I quickly want to touch on a potential issue with diffusion models that then also um, motivates our work on differentially private diffusion models. So one question that has been asked um, in this new work by Carlini is, um, do diffusion models memorize the data? And in particular, they looked at large text to image models. And they found that you can take um, examples from the training set, such as this one. So this is there. Uh, it has a caption, living in the light with N. Graham Lotz. And now what they did is after training the diffusion models, um, they just feed in a prompt here, in this case, N. Graham Lotz. And as it turns out, and it generates an image that's almost the same as the, the training data. And um, yeah, they showed that this holds for, for many of these images. I want to give a small disclaimer that their method they presented in this Kalini paper relies on there being like duplicate data points in the data set. So this image of N. Graham Lotz may be in the data set like 50 times or 100 times. And they kind of rely on, on this to construct um, these, these new prompts. But you know, at this point, we don't really know. Like it may or like also memorize data. Um, if there's no duplicates in the data set. But I guess it's hard to just like find them. I think in any case, what this work shows us that um, diffusion models may memorize training data. And this is an issue for um, sensitive data. And yeah, one way to go around this and what we did in this work is to apply um, differential privacy. Yeah, so differential privacy to the rescue. I guess um, since this is a differential privacy seminar series, most people are familiar with the basics, but I just want to quickly touch base. Um, so the definition uh, would be the following. Um, so a randomized mechanism with the domain and the range. Um, and basically this is very complicated. So let's, um, look at our particular um, problem and uh, make it a little bit more concrete. Um, so for us, uh, this mechanism M would be some sort of a algorithm, differentially private uh, training of diffusion models. Then in our case, um, we would have a data set of images and um, a neighboring data set of images. It's just like a data set where like one element is changed. So like in this case, this might be the first. Um, and then the range in, in for this uh, definition here would be uh, all possible neural network parameters given a particular size of a network. Um, so this may still be quite abstract, but um, one I think one impl implication of the definition that's a little bit easier to understand is that um, you know after we train a diffusion models on on any data set, and um, we want to have that with probability one minus delta. Um, anybody or like an adversary should not be able to confidently tell whether any point um, was part of the training set. So you train your diffusion models, and then if I give you the parameters, you should not be able um, to tell if a particular image was part of this training set. And um, yeah, so the smaller we choose delta and epsilon, basically the more privacy we get. But this comes generally at the price that also like the smaller we choose delta and epsilon, the worse will be the output of the neural network. So if, if you like let delta and epsilon go towards zero, the diffusion models might just um, output like blurry images or random noise. Um, 
I guess what this work is really about is, you know, how for fixed delta and epsilon budget, how can we modify the algorithm M so that we get the best performance of the diffusion model? And I think at this point, we are at the stage where we can start talking about um, definitely private diffusion models. And um, it's based on basically a simple idea of two ingredients. Um, uh, as a small anecdote, like when I started this project, we had like a lot of ideas of like, you know, can we potentially use the inherent noise um, of the fusion models to like show that they're differentially private um, in itself, but kind of all of these directions have failed. So in the end, what we just resorted and wanted to see if it works is, you know, you take the fusion models, you take a uh, DPSGD, which is a yeah very well-known, um, uh, algorithm for to train neural networks differentially private and uh yeah this is basically differentially private diffusion models yeah so let's talk about um dpscd and how it works and i think understanding dpscd is important uh for our work because we make some modifications to uh to dpscd that really like boost our performance um so just for um, to rhyme, rhyme, remind you, on the right here, I have the objective function for the diffusion model. So if we were to train non-privately and we would use stochastic gradient descent, and uh, we basically update the parameter theta by going into direction of the gradients. And here, uh, eta is the learning rate, B is the, the batch size, and then the batch itself would be just a number of indices, uh, P1 to BB. And then this LI is um, a per uh, data point loss. So in this case, if we just take a simple, um, like a one point Monte Carlo estimator um, for the distributions over T and noise, um, we will basically get this LI as follows. So LI would just be based on this one particular data point X0 bi. And now um, from there we can go to DPSGD. So DPSGD, it looks similar to, to SGD, but we have these uh, two changes. Um, so we have an additional term. This is uh, C set. And set here is basically uh, random noise. Um, this might not be the nest notation, it's also a sigma. So don't get confused with the sigma from the diffusion model. The, I indicated here SDP, um, as so you basically add noise to this to this term, um, and then also you have a, a clipping operator. So what the clipping operator does is like you know we we take this gradient, which is a vector, and then the clipping operator uh, computes its norm, and if the norm is larger than some constant c, we basically scale the norm down. Um, so like scale each. Uh, entry of the of the, grade, uh, of the yeah vector, um, and basically what this does is it prevents um, that any of the data points has too much influence on the update of the parameters. And um, yeah, so parameters that determine the privacy level of uh, DPSGD are the um, subsampling rate. Um, so here, capital N. It's the number of total data points we have, and B would be the batch size. Um, so the smaller the subsampling rate, the, lot, uh, the more privacy we have. Also, the smaller the clipping rate, the more privacy we have. The larger the noise magnitude, um, so the more noise we add, the more privacy we get. And then uh, the total number of iterations. So if the, the longer we train for, the less private will the model be. And as a last point, I have one parameter that, that does not directly influence um, the privacy level, but indirectly. Um, so this is the number of model parameters. So if you increase the number of model parameters and leave everything same, you have the same privacy level. Um, but in order to get the same information throughput for each of the parameters, we basically have to reduce the clipping rate. Um, so that's why it's indicated here as like more parameters um, being less private yeah, because we need to increase C for constant 
per parameter information flow. And yeah, so let's talk about uh, some of the motivations for DPS, um, DPS2D for DPDMs or for diffusion models. Because there has been a lot of work, for example, on applying DPS2D to GANs. So I think we quickly need to talk about some of the motivation why we believe that diffusion models are better suited than GANs, for example. Um, so I picked out here two Cypher 10 images. And as before, we can add noise to these images. And um, I mean, we don't have access to the true underlying data distribution, but we have, do have access to the empirical data distribution. So this is basically just um, a, a sum of, a weighted sum of like these delta peaks. And it turns out that if you use this empirical data distribution, we can compute an optimal empirical uh, denoiser function. So here, this optimal denoiser function basically takes each of the data points and weights it um, with this normal distribution. And if we basically compute this optimal denoiser, taking all training images from Cypher 10, um, the output would be as follows. So you can see if we have a lot of noise in the input, we basically the optimal output would be uh, this blurry image. And the less noise we have, the cleaner image we have. In contrast, like what GANs do, for example, uh, they just go directly from complete noise to, to data. And I think that raises the questions is, uh, do diffusion models learn less complex functions than GANs? And this would be important for DPSGD because as we just um, explained, uh, less complexity, or like, yeah, I guess we didn't explain this, like less complexity requires less parameters, but then once we have less parameters, this will, us allow, this will allow us to use um, a smaller cl uh, clipping constant, and therefore we have more privacy. Um, yeah, to basically make this a little bit more concrete, I yeah, could, for example, increase the subsampling rate, the clipping rate, decrease the noise magnitude, or increase the total number of iterations. Um, and to show this now, um, we looked at um, a toy distribution. So we looked at this uh, 2D distribution of a mixture of Gaussians. So we have here nine Gaussians. And we fitted both a diffusion model and again to this data. And now we want to co measure the complexity. Um, so we need, we use like a complexity measure that is often used, um, which is the Frobenius norm of the Jacobian. Um, so for the diffusion model, this may look as follows. So we have this expectation over um, noisy data xt. And then um, we can compute the Jacobian and take the Frobenius norm of it. Now, um, this uh, me a complexity measure here is a function of time. Whereas for the GAN, I mean, the GAN gets as an input just like um, a random latent vector and then outputs the data directly with this g. So in this case, we would take the gradient first vector, the latent vector. Um, this is falsely indicated here also as a function of t, while it's uh, a constant. And, and lastly, we can also, you know, I told you before, once we have trained this denoiser model d, we can plug it in our differential equation and then solve the differential equation. So we can also basically compute the complexity of this whole process of like um, solving the differential equation of a diffusion model. Um, which is indicated here, like with this gradient with respect to dm. Okay, so now that we have explained the complexity measures, let's look at what we get. Um, so on the y-axis, we have here the complexity. On the um, x-axis, we have the noise level. Um, and as you can see, so this is a logarithmic y-axis that even though the diffusion model, when you solve it with a numerical ODE solver in this case, it's more complex than the GAN. What we really need to learn in the diffusion model is only the noise of function D. And this is considerably less complex for each of the noise levels. So at least roughly 100 times less complex. Um, and I think this motivated us that, you know, maybe we can choose models of the same size 
um, get like a lot uh, more um, like fit a uh, lot better fit to the data distribution out of it. So now that we talked about um, motivation, I want to actually go into like detail now what we did so what we changed, for example, to DBSGD to make these differentially private diffusion models work well. Um, so consider again um, our objective function. And then remember like SG, um, SGD. And if we train diffusion models in the non-private case, um, this per loss um, objective would just be like, as we discussed before. Um, now, this is a very high variance estimator because we have, besides the data, we also take a single Monte Carlo estimator about uh, over the distribution PT and also over the noise distribution. Um, and for non-private diffusion models, it doesn't really matter because we can just train for a very long time. So um, there's not really no point in finding like a more expensive estimator uh, that has less variance. Um, however, for DPSD, remember we pay a privacy cost for each iteration. So the less iterations we train, the better. And therefore, a high variance estimator is, is not a good, a good idea. So the idea of noise multiplicity is really like use less and more accurate iterations. And in particular, what we do is um, instead of using a single uh, sample Monte Carlo estimator for, um, for T and for epsilon, um, we basically average it over uh, K values. And um, by a Monte Carlo uh, theory, this yeah, would decrease our variance. So yeah, we de decrease this variance via noise multiplicity here. And I will show you some results later, and we can really see that it gives us a big boost to do this. Um, I have here uh, a small, basically, uh, overview of what what's going on now with like noise multiplicity. I just kind of want to summarize this whole uh, DPSGD um, approach. So what we do is like at training time, we take data points and we add noise to them. We had this forward diffusion process. Um, and we do this for like different time levels. So here we have like sigma one, sigma two, sigma three. And then the denoiser would basically um, give its estimate of like what the clean data is. Um, this would go over in the, into the objective function. Um, then we average over the noise levels, um, which is done like in noise multiplicity. We compute the gradients. We sanitize the gradients by uh, clipping um, the gradient, adding noise to it, as explained before in DPSGD. And then we can basically do by propagation and update the denoiser. And I think the second uh, important thing about DPDMs compared to uh, standard diffusion models is um, choosing the right noise distribution or time distribution T here. So we haven't really talked too much about it. At the beginning, I said you may, for example, just use this, choose this to be um, a uniform distribution over uh, CO2 capital T. Um, but yeah, let's look at, look at it a little bit more closely. Um, so here again, I have these Cypher 10 images. And what I sh show you here is a distribution over, so this noise distribution um, that was proposed in four different papers. Um, so we have like here EDM, the speed prediction, V in VP. And yeah, so the, basically they just, the four papers just propose different noise distributions. In the end, you can think about it like if you train for long enough, it shouldn't really matter because you average everything out. Um, but for us in DPSGD where we have a limited amount of iterations that maybe matters a little bit more. Um, so as you can really tell from the Cypher 10 images, for small noise levels, we learn high frequency details. And for large noise levels, we lose global core structure. But now let's think about it if we have a limited number of iterations, right? So let's say we, we are not learning the global core structure right in, in DBSGD. Then there's not really much of a point of learning the high frequency details, right? So if you 
um, simulate your differential equation, and after half of the uh, time, you like you kind of already like have missed your like um, the distribution, so you're just you're at a stage at like blurry image right now. Learning the high frequency details correctly doesn't really help you much um, because it doesn't like help you to recover like a blurry image. So I think the main takeaway is that we have that if we have a limited number of iterations, we kind of want to shift more towards uh, distributions that focus more on the global cost structure because getting those right in the first place is most important and it doesn't really help us to get the high frequency details right without a global cost structure. Um, and yeah, we'll also show results um, for this noise distribution later on. Yeah, I think we are finally at the point where we can dis discuss results. Um, so we use three metrics to measure the quality. And basically this metrics, the first metric is also um, well known and often used in non uh, DP uh, generative models. So this is called the Fresen and Gibson distance. It's uh, some sort of a proxy for the image quality. As a second metric, we use downstream classifier accuracy. So um, now you can think, you know, we train this differentially private diffusion models, and then we can generate synthetic data from this differentially private diffusion model. Now we may like train in, um, like a class conditional diffusion model, and then we can uh, synthesize class conditional samples. And now using those synthetic samples, we can train classifiers. Um, so for example, like on MNIST or on Cypher 10, and then you can use uh, real data, so real test data that the diffusion model was not trained on and compute test accuracy. And better the, the, uh, the better this test accuracy gets, it kind of gives you, tells you that the better the synthetic data is. And then the last uh, metric it's just like looking at samples and yeah, judging them by looking at them. And before I want to show you some samples, I want to give like a disclaimer that you no know, differential privacy is hard, and these samples still look a lot worse than non-differentially private samples. So like what I showed before, these text-to-image samples. But I think it makes it also really interesting because there's a lot of improvement possible. Um, but yeah, anyway, so let's, let's look at some samples. So what you can see here are um, eight methods uh, that train differentially private general models on this fashion MNIST data set. Um, so this is prior work. And this result here that you can see at the bottom um, is, is our work. So I think we don't have any issues with blurriness here. And we can also like, compare it, for example, um, the last prior work also doesn't really have any blurriness issue. But in contrast to their work, we get the details um, a lot better. And this also- Can you say is, more, sorry, can you say more about the prior work? Like, uh, uh, is this GANs or- Yes, yeah. So um, it's it's mostly GANs and some of these GANs are uh, trained with DPSGD. And then some of them are also trained by um, noising data directly in the, in a feature space and then like training again in a feature space. Um, but yeah, all of all of this prior works are against. And yeah, I think now we can look at some of the numbers here. Um, so this table might be a little bit overwhelming. Um, what you can see here in the second column is this DP epsilon. So we trained uh, diffusion models for different um, privacy levels. So 0 0.2 would be the highest privacy level. Um, and then we have also a 1 and 10. And our work here is highlighted um, like as red. And you can basically see that yeah, we outperform all existing, existing work. Um, we have here also like two versions. So like we have DPDM FID and DPDM accuracy. Um, so I won't go too much into detail in the talk about like what these are, but the main idea is that you know we can solve a differential equation and we have like this vast uh, amount of like prior work that like um, 
proposed like different sort of differential equation solvers. And it turns out if you use more stochastic, so like if you use the stochastic version and use, use uh, stochastic SCE solvers, this works better for FID, but then for accuracy, it turns out to work better if you use the E variation. Um, and I think what's also cool is that this uh, work highlighted here in yellow um, uses um, additional public data to train the general model. And uh, even in that case, we, we basically outperform, um, outperform them. And besides, uh, so, so one question was, what's the epsilon for the um, images that you're showing on the left here? Oh, this is epsilon equals 10. Yeah, I I don't think I have any um, images for epsilon 1 and epsilon 0 0.2 in the slides, but yeah, but can can be found in the paper. Um, so, you, so you mentioned using public data. Did you also consider that in your results? Oh no, this is uh, this work highlighted here in yellow. Mm -hmm. They used, if I remember correctly, for amnest and fashion amnest, they used um, Cipher ten. So they basically pre-trained their models on Cipher ten, and then just like fine-tuned on amnest and fashion amnest. Does that make sense? Yeah, I was just wondering if you had considered doing similar like pre-training. Oh, for our work? Yeah. Um, this will basically uh, come at the end of the of the slides. Okay. <laughs> um, and besides Amnesty and Fashion Amnesty, we also tried. Uh, so this is like these images are small, so like twenty-eight by twenty-eight, and we um, also tried Salib A again. Um, this is prior work using using GANs. And yeah, I mean, as I said before, this is still quite a bit worse than uh, non-differentially private diffusion models, but you know, it's it's quite an improvement over prior work and uh, you know, doing things like public pre-training, um, we can maybe like push this a lot further. Um let's let's come to the ablations and I want to actually show you that what I introduced before, like this nice noise multiplicity. Has have quite a big impact. Um, so here now we can choose uh, the value of, of k, so how many like samples we want to take over the noise. Um, and we basically tried um, just using k equals one, which is done in channel diffusion models, and up to k equals thirty two. And I mean, to some, it may not be as signi significant anymore, at, like between sixteen and thirty two. But I think in general, the trend we can see here is that, um, yeah, that imp like increasing K helps performance. Um, so yeah, we can see this both in FID and this downstream accuracy on here on three um, different architectures. So that's log logistic regression, MLP, and the CNN. Um, one thing that I do want to mention though is that noise multiplicity comes at a time. Um, so basically, as you increase k, you have to evaluate the diffusion models k times for a single step. So it make, basically makes it linearly um, slower at training time. But in general, I would say that in differential privacy, our bottleneck is not really the training time, but rather like the utility we can get for some uh, DP budget. Um, so I think most people would be happy to just have slower training and train longer and therefore get better performance. But I just do want to like put it out as a disclaimer. And the second ablation here would be over the noise distribution. As I mentioned before, is I think there's the general intuition that if we train with more privacy and therefore have like, for example, less iterations, we want to shift the distributions more towards the right, towards the higher noise levels. And that's also reflected in our results. So again, we have here um, MNIST and Fashion MNIST for the all four um, distributions. And <clears throat> the neural network backbone, everything is uh, the same for these, for these uh, runs. Um, and now in highlighted, you can see that for the highest noise level, 
uh, sorry for yeah for the highest privacy level the smallest epsilon value um the speed prediction so this orange curve with is arguably the most to the right work best um whereas for the for less privacy so for epsilon being one in ten um this shifts to the left now one could argue that MNIST and fashion MNIST are relatively easy. So if we want to look at even more complicated data sets, we may have to shift this distribution even further to the right. And some other important tricks that haven't gotten that much attention so far that we use um, that just help a lot in practice is to use small neural networks. So as I uh, motivated before, you know, with small networks, we can get in diffusion models still get a lot of complexity through using like the iterative sampling process. So we use the networks that are smaller than two million parameters. Um, and this allows us then to also use a small clipping constant. We use very large batch sizes. I mean, for me, coming from like non-DP, these seem very large, but I've heard that people in DP use uh, even a lot larger batch sizes than that. Um, yeah, the smallest clipping constant, which can we can do because we have um, a small number of parameters. And then one thing that also turned out to help a lot is uh, using exponential moving average. So rather than, you know, when you train um, your diffusion model, rather than taking the final parameters, you average them over the training time. Um, so it's basically like moving average over all the parameters that you've seen during training. And this is also widely used in standard diffusion models without privacy, but um, we also found this helps quite a bit in privacy. Um, yeah, so I think these results are quite promising. And the question is like, what's next? Um, and as Thomas asked before, so there has been this recent work on DPTM fine tuning of pre-trained checkpoints. So similar to like GAN works, we may also consider um, pre-training um, on other data sets. So there was this recent work, oops, recent work by, by DeepMind um, where they pre-trained the diffusion model on ImageNet and then uh, fine-tuned here on Cypher 10 and this uh, data set Chameleon, which I'm not actually familiar with. But yeah, I think as you can see our, we also tried Cypher 10 at some point but it worked really like badly, like compared to MS and Fashion MS, just because I think it, it was yeah, at this point still too challenging. But once you incorporate uh, public uh, pre training, this can improve a lot. And besides, um, yeah, public pre training and then deep DM fine tuning, I think the other question what, what's next is, um, you know, can we scale deep DMs to billions of parameters and huge data sets? So similar what we what we've done now to for text to image models in non like non private text to image models, and besides the probably engineering challenges, um, there's like one con and one pro. So, in general, as I said before, very large models suffer in DPSGD because um, we will keep the clipping concept relatively small to have reasonable privacy levels. But then on the other hand. Um, the larger the data set, um, the less privacy we have to pay per iteration. So there's this kind of trade-off between like the more data set we have helps us versus like the larger the models are, it hurts us. So yeah, I think there's, all in all, I think there's lots of opportunity for future research. Um, and we also um, made the code and the models for our work public. So I, I hope this, um, can like motivate even yeah, more for future research. And lastly, I want to thank my collaborators for whom this would not have been possible. Um, so yeah, thanks to Anshi, Arash, and Karsten. And that would bring me to the end of my talk. Thank you. Um, thanks for the very interesting talk. I will turn off the recording.